Welcome to Talking Heads on USA Global TV, starring the one and only wonderful Dr. Jacqueline. It's a prestigious place where world-class influencers and experts meet, and where you'll find the most trusted advisors and coaches for all things in life and business. Visit usaglobaltv.com to sign up for our newsletter, get the value you need, and be first in line to learn about events and giveaways and other valuable content. Connect with us. Email Dr. Jacqueline at usaglobaltv.com to talk about how you can become part of USA Global TV. That's USA Global TV, where the doctor is always in. Hello, everyone. Happy Friday or happy Saturday, wherever you are in the world. You are watching or listening to USA Global TV and radio. I'm Dr. Jacqueline Kerbeck. I'm the president, founder, and chief listening officer here at our network. Our show today is Authentic Achievements, and joining me is someone who has many authentic achievements. Her name is Kim Adele Randall. Let's welcome her. Hello. Oh, hi, Dr. Jacqueline. How are you? I'm great. Thanks. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. I'm good. Lovely to see you as always. Nice to see you as well. We missed you last week, but we're glad that you're here today. And we also have a special guest who has registered but is not backstage yet. So we will just carry on talking about authentic achievements, resilience, resistance, control, lack of control. There's so many things going on in the world, especially over there in London, in the UK. Tell us what's the latest since the Queen's passing. What have you been seeing or hearing? Yeah, I I was just saying, it feels very uh, somber here at the moment. Um, I guess, you know, such a lot of change just in this week. You know, we've got a new prime minister. We've sadly lost the Queen. We've got a new king. But there was also all the other challenges that we're already facing, which I know is not dissimilar to everywhere in the world at the moment, right? rising cost of living and the worry about kind of what next and uh, you know, the war in the Ukraine. There's so many things that are going on that are outside of our control that people just seem to be very worried, very nervous. And I, I see and hear a lot of people focusing on the things they can't change and and getting themselves into a into a really sad place. And, and it's, it's so sad to see. And you know, I've just been spending a lot of time this week helping people to change their focus and focus on the things they can control, focus on the things that are within their gift so that they actually don't feel quite so overwhelmed because it's so hard, isn't it, when there's so much change going on to not feel overwhelmed and to, to kind of cling on to some something stable that allows you to see things through. Yes, very good points. And something that I think we know, but we forget is change is abundant. Change is constant. And we always think we can control something that we can't. And then when we can't control it, we start to let our emotions go. And it starts to really just spread through our entire life and into other people's lives too, because we take it and we pass it on to someone else. It's so true. I mean, it, I was reminded this this week, actually, at, at the start of the week by somebody else of one of my favourite poems, which is by Spike Milligan that talks about a smile and, the, you know, you pass it on. And I love I love that poem. I think I've shared it on here once before. Um, but what I've seen this week is just like a smile being contagious, so can misery. You know, when we when we're in a place where we're feeling overwhelmed, where we don't know what's going on, where we get ourselves in that doom loop, we can very easily pass that energy on as well. And then we start to see everybody else is kind of almost having that domino effect of, of that kind of negativity. So it's trying to find a, a halt to that and saying, okay, so what are the things we can do? What are the things that we can change? Even if it's really, really small, but if we can focus on that, then we start to feel better and everything looks better when we feel better. It doesn't look so overwhelming, so unachievable. And the reality is the only thing stronger than fear is hope. And both of them are imagined. We have to imagine what we're fearful of because it hasn't happened yet. So we have to think about it. We create it in our minds. The same is true of anything we hope to happen, anything that we're wishing for. And then we get to choose which one of them that we focus on. Do we focus on the thing that we've created that we're fearful is going to happen? Or do we focus on the thing that we've created that we really want to happen? Because which one of those we decide on will have a massive impact on how we feel, how we show up, and the energy that that we give off to the people around us. 
So true, Kim Adele. And I love the energy that you always bring. And I'm always learning something new. You just used the term doom loop, which I've not heard of before. But it's so true. Something can trigger us. And then in that split second, we make a decision. Are we going to follow through with this feeling of overwhelm, of, of uncomfort, discomfort, <laughs> sadness? Or are we going to actually take a step back, take a breath and look at it and go, OK, I see what's going on. I am aware of what's coming up for me but i choose not to go down this rabbit hole yeah it's, it's and it's so true it's so hard to do isn't it and you know i always say pity loves a party you know when we're in that place where we feel sorry for ourselves and everything's going wrong we want other people to join us because we don't want to feel like we're there on out there on our own and there is uh, there's some statistics that say that if something goes wrong and they, they use this in customer services but if something goes wrong it's called the rule of 49. You will tell seven people who'll tell seven people. So the impact of that one negative piece of information impacts 49 people. But if something goes right, if you're lucky, you will tell three people. <laughs> so we are predisposed to spread the negative news significantly faster <laughs> than we spread the positive news. And it's fascinating to see how to see how that works. But Think about when somebody's passed on positive news, you feel good for them, don't you? You want to celebrate and you want to hear about what they've done. And, and that feels like a great segue, Dr. Jacqueline, because I know you've had an authentic achievement this week and I'd love to hear about it. Thank you so much, Kim Adele. I, I just wanted to comment on something that you said about the seven people versus the three people. That's not something I heard before either. But I think when something really positive or something good happens, we don't necessarily want to reach out to other people because we don't know how long it's going to last, yes. right? It could be so fleeting. And by the time we tell them, it's already over. But also, we don't want to make someone else feel bad. And as you know, we can't make anyone do anything. But but our good news could come on someone else as something as a disappointment to them because they don't have good news. But yet when we do have bad news, we can tell many people because we feel like, OK, people can relate to bad news and no one will judge me. They'll be like sympathetic or compassionate. And it's just this endless loop <laughs> that goes round and round, makes no sense whatsoever. So, it's so true. We do worry that you I think. I, you know, we see this all the time when we're talking about customer service. It's like, well, actually, I had a great, you know, I had a great experience. I'm going to tell people because they might too have a great experience. You know, they might be able to um, also benefit from from that. But we do worry that it feels a little bit like bragging if we go, oh, this has gone really well. For me. <laughs> but I think you know, if we start to look at what are the positive things, the positive experiences, the positive interactions that we've had that we can pass on, and you see the impact it has. You know, I'm. I'm renowned with a crazy woman on the tube that talks to people because, you know, anybody that's been in London, you don't talk on the tube. It's not, you're not supposed to. Everyone sits there quite stoically. But I always end up finding a new friend to chat to um, because you just look for something positive to be able to say. You know, somebody might have a, an amazing outfit. Their hair might look great. They might have a, you know, they might have just done something really kind to somebody. And taking that moment to just reach out and say, I really, I really, you look really lovely today. I just thought I'd say, and watching the impact that that has. And you know, I think if we can try it when we can to put positive energy out into the world, then actually on the days where we really need it, hopefully that positive energy comes back to us because somebody else is is taking that lead as well and, and doing the best to leave every situation, leave every interaction better than they found it. Yes, yes, really great points. And for what you're saying about being on the tube and speaking to people, it's almost like you see someone reach out and you see other people going, what is wrong with her? What's wrong? Why is she speaking to that person? Or you give a compliment and it's like, did she really mean that? Is she a psycho? What does she want? Does she want money? Does she have to borrow? Like, right, it's this endless loop of of information that is completely off base because we're so used to being okay in a state of sadness or discomfort or anger. And if we can flip that around, imagine what the world would be like. Oh, it would be, it would be amazing, wouldn't it? It was reminds me of the, um, I think it's Morgan Freeman's quote that said, how do we change the world? One small random act of kindness at a time. And I love that because that's in our, all of our gifts 
to do one random small act of kindness. And kindness doesn't have to cost anything or be big, does it? It can just be holding the door open for somebody or you know, helping helping somebody down the stairs if they've got a you know, push chair or something. It can be really small, but if we keep doing it, then that person's had something good happen to them that day. Might be the only good thing they've had happen to them that day. Um, and you know, I try this with, with Scarlett all the time. You know, what have we done today that's kind? Um, and when you know she come ha- comes home and, and somebody has been unkind to her, um, which she's you know, she's five, it happens. Kids, you know, kids sometimes are a little bit cruel. Um, but I'll always say to them, you know, maybe they've had a really sad day, darling. Maybe they're being unkind to you because they're feeling really sad, and that doesn't make it right, and it doesn't mean it's acceptable. But perhaps if you could just be extra kind to them, then that might give them something positive to be able to take away. Um, And what we're finding is actually they're starting to not bully her for a loan because actually she's killing them with kindness, I think, when it gets to the end of it. But as a result, some of these people that were being mean to her have become her friends because she reached out to them at a place where we assume when people are angry and mean and unkind that they're doing it on purpose. And very often they're overwhelmed with their own emotions that, you know, I I learned from my many disasters in my life that people don't hurt us on purpose. The fact is they're dealing with their own pain and we become collateral damage. They just weren't thinking about us. So why do we have to layer on our pain to their pain? That's why you end up in, you know, I've ended up in arguments where you can't tell somebody how they've made you feel. And it's like, oh, it's all about you now. (laughs) I'll tell you how I was feeling because I was feeling really bad. And you're like, oh, okay. (laughs) Um, Maybe what I should do is, and now I don't, I just keep that to myself and find an alternate place to deal with that pain Um, because they wouldn't have meant to make you that sad. They wouldn't have meant to um, really hurt you in the way that they did. They were just doing the best they could with what they'd got and they weren't thinking. Yeah, so true. So true. I actually had something happen last weekend I go for a walk. I I walk about seven or eight miles on a Saturday and a Sunday. And there's a little delicatessen that's maybe three miles from here. And I like on the way back to circle and then stop and have my little guilty pleasure of a sandwich, which I never eat except when I'm doing this. And so I went in and I got my sandwich and I waited online to to pay for it. There's somebody who was being waited on. And there was a woman who had her things on the counter and then me with my little sandwich. And another cashier came on the other side of the room and said, Hey, I'm opening up here if somebody wants to come over. So I looked at the woman in front of me and she didn't make any moves. So I thought, okay. So I zip up to the other counter. I put down my sandwich. And now the woman who was waiting online, she's now there. And another woman who I never saw before, who has a bunch of sandwiches, she apparently knew this woman. So the, the woman with the sandwiches says, you're so rude to me. So I turned around, I said, I'm sorry, are you speaking to me? And she said, well, my friend was next. And I said, well, I'm really sorry. Please go ahead. You didn't make any movement toward, and I thought if you're going to, you know, because you're next, your stuff is down. So the woman continues on. I said, no, I'm not rude. I'm apologizing. I'm very sorry. I've picked up my sandwich. I have moved aside. And I said, please go ahead. And she wouldn't go ahead. So now the cashier's like, well, someone please go ahead. <laughs> Somebody buy a sandwich. Please <laughs> buy a sandwich. <laughs> So I paid for the sandwich and I turned around and I said, honestly, I am not rude. Your friend, you weren't moving. So I thought, okay, I'll go. But I apologize again. And neither one of them would even look at me. It was crazy. It's it's bizarre, isn't it? I mean... I, over here sometimes, you know, we, we're, we're terribly, terribly polite about everything. And I spotted this in, in shops. We, like you know, People bash into you with their trolleys. And I've got a horrendous habit of saying sorry. I'm like, what am I saying sorry for? For standing in the aisle quite clearly for doing what I was doing already. And, and I, it wasn't until I spotted Scarlett started to do it as well. I was like, oh, no, I'm making her responsible for everybody else just being a little bit careless but but you see people that get that so angry and, and so into that argument that they can't listen they can't hear I mean I, I don't, I'm sure there's road rage there same, same as there is here we've got one roundabout um in, in Grantham where I live and literally it's like the minute people get close to that roundabout they all forget how to drive 
it's like it just it's carnage every single day but you kind of know so we we think it's hilarious you sit there and go oh, here we are i'm gonna get around that roundabout it'll be fine we'll just wait our turn but the amount of people that are getting really angry about it and then carry on the argument they like follow each other go in an opposite direction so they can continue to yell and you think well i wonder what's going on in people's lives that they're they're not they're not willing to listen to the apology because it yeah, like yours it was it was a genuine mistake it didn't look like she was going to move so you you moved and then when she had you offered to let her go first it it makes me worry about how anxious people must be feeling that they're already you know if you, if you think about our emotions being like a cup it already feels like people's cup is overflowing um, and therefore the slightest little thing is, is likely to send them into that red mist moment isn't it Yes. And I never heard that phrase red mist moment. I love that too. I'm learning so much. There is actually a movie. I want to say the title is Road Rage, but I'm not sure. It's with Russell Crowe and yeah, something I'm happened. Did you see it? Yes. Yes, I did. Yes. It, something happens to him. I can't. Oh, so a woman cuts him off. And from there on, the whole thing, he just gets completely out of control. And it's from one extreme to the other. But to your point, I feel like what happened in that delicatessen, because of course I had to analyze it, why not waste more time, is that <laughs> the other friend with all the sandwiches, she was going through something because the lady who was online in front of me, she didn't say anything. She was, you know, she just stood there. She wasn't like, you you know, but the other woman had something going on with her unrelated and then decided to take it out on this moment. And then I feel like she couldn't look at me because she was probably ashamed or embarrassed and didn't know what to say. Well, we've all been there, haven't we? You have that. You have those moments because one of the one of the challenges, as we know, is that our emotional brain responds twenty four times faster than our thinking brain. So something happens, and we don't respond to what's happened. We respond to what we've made it mean. Mm -hmm. So we've made it mean something that's created an emotion, and now we're over here. We're playing in the emotion. We're doing something else. So some, you know, so we were triggered by this. And then actually there's that moment, isn't it, where the mist starts to settle and you can look at it and go, oh, okay. <laughs> I might have slightly overreacted here. Potentially I've gone too far down this road. Uh, and one of the things that we don't want to do is we don't want to lose space. So so that's one of the reasons why, you know, if, if anyone in your business is, is got themselves into an argument, it's really hard for them to back away, even if they suddenly realise that their point might not be um, the most relevant point. So trying to always find a space for people to be able to change direction without losing face is crucial because we because if not, we have to kind of front it out, don't we? It's like, no, and I'm right. <laughs> Indignant that you took my friend's face in the sandwich queue. <laughs> <laughs> It's very true. You watch people start to become unhinged. And if you don't play into it, it's amazing because they keep going, they keep going, but yet you're not feeding that fire. And all of a sudden you can see their balloons starting to deflate because they want you to engage with them. They they want this to escalate even, but don't go there. That's what I say. Well, it, it's true, though, isn't it? I mean, fire only ex only continues if it gets oxygen, if it gets fanned. So, if, you know, when we, and that's why they say, I didn't feel to, I didn't feel to the fire. It's like when you get an argument, that's what we do. We put more stuff in there. We give it more room to to move instead of getting really comfortable with the silence and allowing the person giving giving them the space to go through that um, you know, red mist moment by by themselves without without feeling like you've got to go and join them in it. You know, I learned the most of that, having a little one. You know, when they have those moments, you know, when, she's really, when she was really little, and she'd have those moments where we struggle as adults to deal with our emotions. So how these poor little souls do when they've not got the, um, they've not got the maturity, they've not got the words, they've not got the, um, the, the experience to be able to say what they're feeling, but they're feeling it. Um, and I remember having a toddler tantrum once we were in, I were in a supermarket and I'd done the most horrendous thing any parent can do. She was pushing one of those little children's versions of the shopping trolley and I touched the adult handle um, and that was it. I was like, don't melt down. We're on the floor. 
Um, like we're, in, we're in mass tears and I was like, okay, it's a bit awkward. Everyone was looking at me like I was a horrendous mother. But I realised she was in chaos. She, she, Her emotions had taken over. She was in chaos. The last thing she needed was for me to join her in chaos. So I was embarrassed. I was looking around. I could have yelled at her. I could have picked her up and carried her out of the out of the shop, but both of those would have been joining her in chaos. So I remember moving slightly to one side and saying to her, um, well, Mummy can see that you're really upset, but I can't help you right now because I don't know what's wrong and you can't tell Mummy what's wrong. So I'm just going to stand here and, and look at you know, look at these lovely clothes until you're ready to be able to tell me. And it carried on for a few more seconds. And then she literally, commando style, arm over arm, crawled into the centre of the aisle. And I was getting hotter and hotter because people were staring at me at this point. And I, and I tried to stay calm and I looked at her and I was like, no, sweetheart, mummy can see you and she can hear you. But I can't help you because I don't know what's wrong because you can't tell me what's wrong. So take your time, take a breath. And when you're ready to tell mummy, we'll chat. And it probably carried on for another 30 seconds or so. And then, and then she kind of calmed down. She got back in control of her emotions and she came and stood next to me. And I said, oh, I said, so can I ask? were you frustrated? And she like nodded. And I said, and was it because mummy touched the handle? And so she nodded. And I said, did you think that that meant mummy didn't trust that you knew what you were doing? And she nodded. I said, it wasn't for any of those reasons, my darling. It's just that the trolley was about to head towards the shelving unit and there was glass bottles on it. And if you'd have broken one of those, you could have got hurt. So I was just trying to make sure that you stayed safe. But I appreciate, i made you frustrated because I made you think I didn't trust you. So I'm very sorry about that. Um, so she kind of like, Lord, and I was like, do you think we can try again now? And she, like, she like nodded. She got on the trolley and off she went. And I walked past this woman who'd been staring at me the whole time. And I was convinced that I was the worst mother in the world. And she went, can I just say, should you handle that brilliantly? She said, I would have probably screamed at her and ran out of the, ran out of the shop. And I said, well, to be fair, I said, it crossed my mind. <laughs> so there were moments where I was like, oh my God, I don't want anyone staring at me. I said, but I realised that's my little girl. I'm responsible for her um, and how she gets brought up. And I don't know you and I may never see you again. So if you think I'm a bad mum, then that's your choice. That's your prerogative. But if I make my choices because you might think that, then I'm probably being a bad mum because I'm not making the choice for my child I'm making my choice based on what I perceive will be your perception of me. Kim Adele, I have to say that is brilliant. That was the word I was thinking, brilliant. You're a great mom. I love how you handled that whole thing. Thank you. That was like, you should be a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bless you. That's so kind. But it, it, I, it is hard. I mean, look, you see, you see your kids and they are in chaos and they are. And, and now yeah, I'm, I'm very lucky and you've met. You've met my lovely little girl and I am very biased. She is awesome. She is a gift from God. Um, but she's also very calm. She's very collected. You know, when she goes, uh, when my um, in-laws and that say, she, she's like, she's like a baby adult. She's the constant mediator. She's always looking for, you know, for, for the other person's perspective, for somebody else's um, point of view. And yet she's also very, very confident in of herself but I think she was blessed she's always kind of been, <laughs> been like that um but I try really hard to reason with her when when things are, are going wrong don't go wrong we, we all lose our temper we all yeah we all yell I I, I did yell at her the other day um unfortunately and then when she came, when she came up down I was like okay mummy's very sorry that mummy yelled at you because that means mummy lost control of her emotions and that wasn't very clever for mummy so mummy's sorry but mummy was okay to be frustrated because 52 times of asking you to eat your dinner is a little bit too many. <laughs> so I'm going to apologise for getting angry. I'm not going to apologise for, for the fact that I was frustrated. Anything you would like to apologise for? She's like, yes, mummy, not eating my dinner. And I was like, okay. So now we're okay. We've both apologised. We've had a little hug. What should we do now? And she went, why don't we eat our dinner? Great point. <laughs> Sit down. Let's eat our dinner. Um, <laughs> But, it, but it's kind of in trying to kind of create that more reasoning approach, that kind of piece that says, actually, we do, we get lost in other people's perception. And, and 
kids don't come with a manual. They, there's no handbook. You don't get to go and say, oh, hold on, where, page 307 is going to be how I deal with this particular situation. So, you know, I, I always say to her, every single person in the world is learning, darling. We're all learning. Um, I'm older than you. I'm still learning. So sometimes we will get it wrong. It doesn't make us ba a bad person. It means we made a bad choice. But we get to learn from the bad choice and we get to make a better choice next time. But don't define the two. And I think that's because I, I unfortunately used to make every bad choice make me a bad person. Um, and, and I made it about me. And, and that's a devastating space to be in. And sadly, I see so many people that are in the same space that they make it, you know, I'm I'm bad because I did this. It's like, no, no, you made a bad choice. You get to choose again. But you start telling yourself you're bad. You start telling yourself you're not good enough. You start telling yourself that um, you can't do these things. And you'll be right because you'll stop trying. You'll stop learning. You'll stop doing them. And, and you know, the one of the most powerful words that I think there is in the English language is the word yet. When you say to people, Scarlett says this to me all the time, she comes in and she's like, oh, mummy, I'm not very good at colouring. And at five, it's like devastation, isn't it? And I'm like, okay, darling, you're not good at colouring yet. But look how much better you are at colouring today than you were yesterday. And look how much better at colouring you were yesterday to last week. So you're getting to be quite good at colouring, aren't you? She's like, yes, mummy, I'm getting better. <laughs> because when we use the word yet, we allow our subconscious mind to realise it's still important to us and to look for ways to help us to achieve it. So, you know, whatever it is we're telling ourselves we haven't got yet, you know, I'm not a millionaire yet. I've not, you know, I've not got the house of my dreams yet. I've not got a size eight figure yet. Whatever it is that, you know, that we're, that we're saying to ourselves, try adding the word yet, because I promise you it totally changes how you view the likely success of what you're going to do. And very quickly, you'll realize that you are getting closer to your dream. Everything you said is so relevant and spot on. I, I just wish we could spend hours just looking at each component of it because there's so much value that you shared. And I love about the relationship you have with Scarlett. It, it just sounds so beautiful. And when you think about witnessing someone screaming at their child in public, we've all seen it, even on a plane, for example, and the, the kids screaming and crying, you know there's an underlying problem. And yet screaming at them is not going to help the situation. And of course, you're aware that other people know what's going on, right? We, we're in a plane. We all know that there's a child screaming. And I always feel like give those people grace because it's the parent doesn't know what the problem is. The child, to your point, doesn't know how they're supposed to be feeling. They just know they don't feel right at that moment. And yet we judge, she's a bad parent. Why can't she shut that kid up? Or that kid has no, you know, no, it's none of that. No, it's the fact that we're stuck in that emotion. We're stuck in that emotional loop. And we very often, same as we, we, we parent like we lead, based on how we've seen it done. So if we're yelling and screaming and screeching at people, it's probably because that's what we've seen or that's what happened to us when we when we were kids. And therefore we we emulate it, we, we pass it on, not because we're meaning to be bad, but because that's what we think, that's all we know. Um, so it's kind of taking ourselves out and I guess you know, I went and, and kind of had to rewire, reframe my thinking that I'd created when I was a child. Um, and now I'm very conscious of that and desperately trying to make sure that I don't create in Scarlet a need for her to go and rewire herself when she hits my age and realises that what she'd made situations mean um, created her I am statements created what she thinks about herself. And, and you're right, you know, you never know. Somebody used an amazing phrase, which I really loved the, the, um, the other day. And they said, you never know where somebody else's shoes are pinching. Because um, if we think about it, if you ever wear shoes and they're pinched, it really hurts. It? <laughs> and, and you lose concentration and you can't, like, you just can't think. Um, and I loved that because it was like, actually, you don't. You don't know what they're going through. You don't know what else has happened in their day in their life in their week in what else is going on and, and therefore all we can do is is you know, is be kind where where we can because if we you know if we can do that and we can stop you know, we can stop that person we can have these 
you know, we can possibly help them because they're already sat there dealing with a child that's in chaos. They're now in chaos because they've joined them. But all the time, they're probably fear, fearing what everybody else is saying, which is adding fuel to the chaos, <laughs> which is making them more and more angry and getting them to, uh, like, well, you just need to stop. <laughs> you just need to stop. It's like, that's not going to help because the child's in chaos and they want to be listen to they want to be understood they want to be respected they want you to be able to help them find what you know whatever's wrong you know, give them so you know, help them find the words but giving it them in a calming voice helps them sometimes even if they can't get what they want just the fact that you've understood it that you've known what it is so like one of the things that that i found out when i started researching this i did I'm in the middle of a child psychology um course at the moment because I'm really trying to make sure I do a good job with Scarly um and when toddlers run off from us which is the most <laughs> annoying thing as a parent and the most terrifying because they're running away and you're like oh my god they don't know they don't know the dangers please don't do that it's actually an act of love because they know with absolute certainty that you'll catch them because you love them they know you're going to come and find them it's like when a child won't put their shoes on when you need to go out and again, as, as parents, that can be really frustrating. You've got the school run, you've got a really tight turnaround to do that and the commute, and you kind of go, just need the shoes to be on, um, and they're not doing it. Again, it's an act of love. The child knows that when they put the shoes on, they're going to leave the house. And when they leave the house, they're going to leave you. Uh, they don't know how to use the words. They don't know how to express that that's what they're holding back. They take as long as possible to elongate their time with you. And kids don't understand the difference between positive and negative attention. It's just attention. So whether you're yelling at them or whether you're giving them a cuddle, you're giving them attention. And therefore, they'll they'll find ways to get more of it. So it's trying to kind of pull ourselves back from our own chaos and say, OK, how might I help give them the lifeline to get back from chaos so that they can find that calming space, that they can find that way through and that then we can chat about it then we can help and make sure that they learn and that you know I was sit with Scarly afterwards if, you know, if she's got really angry or she's done something really naughty um, and we'll go okay well let's just sit and let's talk it through let's understand what was happening let's understand why I've asked you not to do that again let's understand what the implications are and then we can learn to we can learn together um, but doing it when you're both calm um, if you can't get to a calm space, take a moment to, to, if you can, move away from it so that you can find that space for yourself and be kind to yourself as much as you're being kind to others, I think. Yes, I agree with you. And I think that course is really paying off in spades. It sounds like you're learning quite a lot. <laughs> and I, I also think even when it comes to adults, we have to provide a safe space for the other person by listening and not judging and not going down that path where they're going. You can see when someone is falling apart and you just mentioned what you witnessed with Scarlett and, and the choice that you made. And if we made those types of choices more often, people would feel heard. They would feel that they matter. And that's what we all want, isn't it? To know that we're loved and that we matter instead mm -hmm. of what's wrong with us, what we didn't do right, you know, and, and being yelled at and judged. We just want to be heard and we can understand that we made a bad choice. That's a lot different and feels a lot different than we're a bad person. Yeah, yeah. because it's, you know, it's never about the person, is it? It's the choice. It's, it's like, you don't, don't make it about you because if you make it about you, it will become your or it will become your everyday behavior because you've started to expect it of yourself and so is everybody else mm -hmm. whereas if you make it about oh that was a silly choice <laughs> because because of that choice you now are not going to get to do this or this okay but you knew that didn't you because you were given three warnings because it's always three warnings and you're going to lose whatever it is that you've got to lose and you still chose to go ahead and do it yes mummy well that's fine because it means you can't do this, but tomorrow's a brand new day and you get to make a different choice. So you're not going to lose it forever. It starts again tomorrow. I mean, it might be, have been, we're going to go to the movies. Actually, that was one of them. Once you want to go and see Sing Two. And she was given three warnings. She was really behaving badly. It was like, if you keep going, mum's going to cancel the tickets 
because I'm not rewarding this behavior. So you're on your third warning. Um, the next time that you do it, that's it, it's, it's gone. Um, so she did, she did something else. So I, I phoned up and I, I canceled the tickets. Um, and she was like, do I not get to go at all? I was like, darling, tomorrow is a brand new day. If you make better choices, we'll go tomorrow. Um, and we did. She had a great day the next day, and we went to the went to the cinema, and we had a fab time. It's like it's not, I'm not going to give you some arbitrary punishment that lasts a lifetime, but I'm just going to say you're not getting it today. And, and it's really hard sometimes because you then have to follow through. And to be fair, you know, we're doing really nice to go to the cinema and have two hours where you were like we're going to be entertained because she because she was in a bad space. Um, but it was like that's not going to help because like you know I've, I've done it before. It's like that there'll be no telly for the rest of the day. And trust me, there were moments we really want to put the telly mm -hmm. on to just like to, to just not have your name called for like the five hundredth time. But but it's kind of finding that inner strength to go no i'm not gonna i'm not gonna give in because the minute i give in i create in her uh, a thing that goes if i just push a little more i just push a little bit more and um, then i'll get what i want whereas you know now she <laughs> she knows mummy's evil if mummy says no after after three goes you ain't getting it <laughs> because in the long run it won't help her it won't help her be the best you know, to be the happiest that she can be and and I think it's my job to help teach her how to be happy in of herself because she's the person she's going to be with for life, isn't she? You're actually being selfless because what would be better for you would be to go to the show or to watch the television. But yet, you know, as a mother, that it's not about what you need in that moment. It's about giving her boundaries and setting up processes and systems that she understands if I do this, then this is a result of that. That's how I grew up as well. Do this, get that, do this, get that. Um, I think we could have an entire other show about when we make a bad choice and we realize that it's a bad choice and we go down a different path, how other people still judge us about oh oh, look what that person did. And now they're doing this and we're supposed to forgive them when they did that. We, we see this all the time. That could be a completely different show. Oh, but it could, it absolutely could. It, it goes down to the same thing that when you were in that store and that other customer was there witnessing it, that you had to make a decision. Were you going to get all caught up with, oh, I'm so embarrassed. This is mortifying. What am I? And we do that too. We make it about, other people and that woman you didn't even know her you may never see her again maybe she would go and tell seven people that she witnessed this and this woman's not a good mother but that's not the truth yeah. and she didn't feel that way anyway so the point is we think we know how people feel and we we just we don't know and and why we we go down that path of valuing ourselves and our actions and our decisions by what people we don't even know are thinking even people we know that doesn't mean that they're making all the best choices either. So are we going to sin judgment of them? It just goes back and forth. There has to be a stake in the ground somewhere to say, no, I'm going to start with myself. It's, it's so true. And you know, I remember years ago being asked to do this exercise where I had to go and ask people that I cared about and people that I knew and, and respected if they could say, what were the two or three things that they um, admired about me or thought I did well? And what were the two or three things that they thought I got in my own way? And when it came back, almost unanimously, people's two things was that I was brave and fearless. And I was like, I live in fear every day. I live in fear of what people think of me. I live in fear of being stupid, of getting it wrong, of messing up. I, was, I really didn't understand. So I remember going and asking them, you're going to have to help me. Brave and fearless, I don't get it. Um, I'm currently in the 36th house that I've lived in since I left home at 21. <laughs> So I've moved a lot. Um, and that was their point. They were like, you will literally up sticks and move to a place where you know nobody for a job you're not even convinced you can do. And we think that's brave and fearless. And I was like, interesting. I thought it was flighty and a little bit stupid. So I'd spent years convincing myself that everybody else's view of me was that I was flighty and a little bit stupid until I did the really radical thing of asking them what they thought of me <laughs> and realising that, Flighting a bit stupid was my projection of me. That's what I thought about me, that I was now projecting out on everybody else and making it what they thought about me. And that's kind of what we do. So 
I think sometimes ask the question, <laughs> ask people what they think of you. You'll be surprised um, pleasantly <laughs> by what they tell you. Mm, absolutely. It takes that courage to ask someone and, and of course, not judge the answer, whatever the answer is. I think that's a really important part. So our show has flown by. Our guest wasn't here. I really forgot that he wasn't here. We're sorry that he wasn't here. So we hope that he will rebook. And before we close out, I had something happened yesterday that I feel kind of proud about, but it's not about ego. I'm actually going to share it because I hope it'll help someone else. So it used to be Wednesdays at the end of the day, I was exhausted because I'm in front of so many lights and so many screens and there's all these windows and my eyes start to bother me. Well, it's moved to Thursday. I don't know why. So on Thursdays, I am really just exhausted physically and mentally. And that's my day to go to the gym. And I know when I go to the gym, I'm going to have to push myself because that's how I am. Everything. It's not just like I'm going to cruise in and do, no, I have to <laughs> hardcore everything I do. So as I'm walking to the gym, it's about half a mile. I'm thinking to myself, you know what you're going to have to do today. You know it. And I'm thinking, no, I'm, I'm not doing it. Yes, you're going to have to do it because you don't want to do it. That's why you have to do it. So what I've been doing is for the last number of weeks, I've been doing a straight arm plank, like a push up. And I've been timing myself and there've been a few times when I've had family members here and they actually videotaped it and they, they were my witness. So I got up to 18 minutes last week, wow. so 18 minutes, straight arm plank, which is different than a bent arm plank because a bent arm plank for me, it's not as difficult because I have really strong core. So the straight arm is engaging my, uh, my upper body and it's, and your wrist. So Anyway, I'm walking into the gym and I'm saying to myself, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. And then I said, you're going to do it. So I start doing some stretches. There's nobody in this section of the gym. And I just start doing it. I can't put my music on because they've got music playing and it's not the kind of music that I like. And I'm thinking if only I could put my music on. So before I start, I, I put on my music and I can't hear it. So I'm thinking, OK, now you've got an excuse because you can't hear the music. Are you going to do it or are you not going to do it? So now somebody comes into the gym and they're rolling a bike to get it into the place. And I'm thinking, OK, now there's this guy. And I'm like, that's it. Just do it. Set the timer. Get ready to go. So I set the timer. I get into position. I start. I'm at two minutes and I'm thinking, I, I can't do this. I don't feel like doing it. I'm in a bad mood. I'm tired. Like this was what goes through your head, right? So I say to myself, OK, let's close our eyes and transport ourselves somewhere else. You're in Paris right now. You're doing this. You're doing that. And 20 seconds went by. I'm thinking like five minutes went by. So as it turns out, I make a deal with myself. This is all in my head. Okay? Well, I'm I make a deal with myself that when, not if, when I get to the 20 minutes, I will not have to do this ever again. Cause I'm not going to go 21, 25. I'm not going for some record. I'm just doing it for myself. So I seem pretty pleased with myself about this arrangement. So, <laughs> so now it's 10 minutes and I'm thinking to myself, you made it halfway through. I get to 12 minutes and I'm thinking, I don't know. Like I just, I really didn't feel like doing it. It just, and the, the bottom line is I have to show, cause I took a picture of it. The bottom line is I did it. And I went 20 minutes, 18 seconds. And Kim Adele, when I tell you that when I got up from my mat, my wrists were, they were like glued. Like I, I actually had to sit on them. So I, I sat on them and I did leg raises because I had no feeling left in my, in my hands. And then to continue to the end of the story, there was no one to celebrate with. There was no one. There was now two guys in the section of the gym. And obviously they had to see that I was doing a plan for a very long time. No one said anything to me. I didn't say anything to them. I took a little video when I was at the gym after they had left. And I thought, you know, I look horrible. And I thought, who cares? I want to inspire people. That's the whole point. That even though I was exhausted, I didn't feel like doing it. There was no award. There was no trophy. There was no cheering audience. It was just me. And that was enough. Oh, I love that. And you should be so proud. And I, we were talking about this just yesterday, that when we win in here, we win out here. Yes. Um, 
because that's where the battle is. The battle's in our head first. Uh, and you've just proved that so eloquently. You know, you, And we do, we battle ourselves. We have these conversations. And like, we do, and you, you kind of almost play every character in the in the movie in your head uh, while you're trying to, to kind of work those parts through. But how good did you feel when you'd done it? I felt great because mentally, you know, I'm 59 and a half this month. And mentally, I said to myself, this is something you will remember for the rest of your life. I'm all about gold stars. I have that in my book about everything to me is like, uh, it's a certification, it's a degree, it's an accomplishment. It's And so this was going to be my gold star at 59 and a half, something that I'll remember. Now I'll go on to something else, but I will certainly revel in the moment. That's why I took the pictures and put it on social media so that people realize you can. I was battling myself the whole time until 18 minutes. I was shaking so badly, Kim Adele. My whole body was shaking. And I just said, you're there. You've made it. And so that's the point that this is so strong. It's it can our minds can help us get through pretty much anything if we forget about the pain. I said to myself also, this pain is temporary, unless I break my wrist, thank God I didn't. The pain is temporary, but the accomplishment will be forever. I, I love it. And it's, it's so right, it's just reminding me of, it. there was a, a video, I'll try and find it. And it's a, it was an American school and it was um, a soccer team. And one of, the, one of the players had got another player on his back and he was having to do a bear crawl. Uh, and he was like, I can't, I can't go any further. And, and he, the coach was like, it's just a hundred yards. It's just a hundred yards. And this guy's going, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. And he kept saying, you're nearly there. You're nearly there. Just a hundred yards. And you watch it. He does the entire length of the pitch, wow. the whole length. And he, he started off thinking you couldn't do a hundred yards. Um, and he didn't realize he'd done it. He was still going. <laughs> and the coach was like, turn around and see how far you've come. Um, and it was literally blown away. But all of the, it's a great thing to watch because it was, it was a real demonstration, like you've just given us a great demonstration of that mind over matter. Is that kind of get, putting your mind on the, you know, on the outcome? I think there's, I can't remember who's quoted it, but says obstacles are the things we see when we take our eye off the goal. When we're focused on the goal, actually, we start to achieve it because that's where <laughs> that's where we're heading. And, and we do, you know, as you as you so beautifully put. We do bargain with ourselves along the way. It's like, if you do this, you can have that. If you do this, you can have that. Um, so that we can actually find that that nugget, that little element more of that mental resilience that's going to allow us to like push on through to get to the you know, to get to the um, other side to try uh, to try and achieve something. And I, and I love that. And I bet it will inspire people. It's inspired me to try a plank, let alone let, let, let full on one, because yeah, I. I always say I can't, uh, and actually, what I mean is I won't. <laughs> so yeah. next week, I will I will give you an update on whether or not I I will have done it. I will let you know, I'll let you know how well I did it. Too. You know, no, there's no judgment. And by the way, planks are great for everyone, unless you have bad knees or bad wrists or something. I mean, I'm not a doctor, so please do check with your physician. But if you set a goal for yourself of 10 seconds, if it's something you've never done before, make it a small goal that's a huge win. And then the next time, 15 seconds. I was a certified trainer for years. And that's what it is, is that, you know, I'll give an example. There are these things that um, there's a bar that like a universal machine, and you can put these these black things, I don't know what they're called. You put your elbows in them and then you, you're you hanging, right? You have to jump up and then you're hanging. You bring your knees up to your chest. And when you first start, you might have to have somebody helping you or you can bring your legs straight out. And for years, I would watch people jump up. They didn't even need any help getting up. They just jump up and start doing it. And then I see people with 25 pound weights between their legs. <laughs> so I can't do that, but I can stand on a stool reach up, put my arms in there. And then I can do, you know, sets of 25. I could do four sets of 25. And that's okay with me that I need mm -hmm. that assistance because I'm making the effort and I know how important it is for our core and our backs to be strong, especially as we get older. So I would just don't have big expectations, have small goals that you set for yourself. And then just tell yourself, I'm doing this because it's something new and it's going to be good for me. Unless I your physician that. says otherwise, so yeah, no, I, I love that. I'm definitely, I'm definitely going to give it a go. One, one, um, and you, you, sometimes you just need to be spurred on, don't you, to go. Actually, you just, 
you just need to keep going. And I remember, um, again, I can't remember whose quote it is, but it was, you can't means you must. So when you say, I can't do this, it means you must do it. So actually, you've got to, you've got to find a way. <laughs> That's what I said to myself when I was walking to the gym. I'm like, you have to do this because you don't want to do it. It's like when you wake up, what are the things you don't want to do? Do them first. Get them out of the way, and then it's a huge, it's a huge win. But we have to to close now because the power of etiquette matters is coming up, and I could stay here and speak with you all day, Kim Adele. Please tell people how they can reach out to you, how they can engage with you, hire you. Of course. Uh, so I mainly work with um, businesses that are looking at ensuring that they're ready for an exit strategy, even if that's not for a few years. So. Many business owners find themselves stuck working in the business, not working on the business. And that's where I can help. So if you're a business owner and you're struggling because you spend all your time in it, not on it, please do get in touch. Or if you've got a story that you'd like to share with us, we would love to have you on here as a guest. You can reach out to me at kim at kimadelrandall.com or you can find out more about what we're doing at www.authenticachievements.com. Brilliant. Thank you, Kim Adele. And I also just heard from our guest for today, and there was a power failure, so he oh, didn't have access. So we'll look forward to having him back again. All right, folks, we're signing off for today, right now, and we will be back momentarily in less than 10 minutes with the power of etiquette and manners. And we're going to be meeting with Elsa Boutarek, who joins us from Paris and is going to talk to us about wardrobe oh. management. I love that. Oh, I look forward to that. <laughs> bye, everyone. Bye, Kim Adele. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.